This podcast is sponsored by nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now today, I will be talking to a legend of the comedy store most people have never heard of, and I am talking about Greg Hilbers. Greg was part of that 70s, you know, generation of comedy store comedy, the revolution, I should say, with guys like Leno, Letterman, Tom Dreesen, Gallagher, you know, uh, Michael Keaton, Bruce Baum, all those great comics who were there at that time. And I'm going to have him on the show today, and we're going to talk about the days at the comedy store that he spent. You know, he got to be on the comedy shop with Norm Crosby. You know, he he was probably there when the strike happened. I'm going to ask him about that. And it's going to be a great conversation. I cannot wait. I love talking to the old comedy store guys and talk about the shit that went down. So many of those guys never get asked to do interviews about the comedy store, especially when that documentary came out, you know, last year. I was really shocked that Greg wasn't amongst the people who got interviewed for it. And so we're going to have a chat about all of that today. So yeah, here is my interview with Greg Hilbers. Hello? Hey, Greg. Welcome to the show, sir. How are you today? Hey, Tommy. What's going on? Oh, nothing much. How's everything over there? Oh, you know, I just, uh, just doing it. You know, it's, uh, uh, just a cool day in Huntington Beach. That's where I live. Nice, nice. How's the weather over there? It, well, it's been very good this year because uh, uh, it's really been moderate. You know, uh, I, my ceiling fan index is I haven't had to use a ceiling fan all year. So uh, other years, uh, every night I have to use a ceiling fan, you know, so it's nice to have a cool night, you know, to sleep in. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> This is uh, such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Oh, it's, it's my pleasure. My pleasure. So, going back in time, were you a funny kid growing up? You know, yes, I think I was. Because uh, going back to the second grade, uh, we used to have a uh, story hour every week, something like that. Yeah. He got up and he told a story and uh, from a book or something. And then the teacher would tell you to cover your eyes and uh, vote who was your favorite storyteller. And I remember the uh, sister Stevens, that was her name, uh, she whispered in my ear, uh, Greg, you've won three in a row, and uh, we're going to have to let somebody else win this week. So uh, out of 52nd graders, uh, you know, looking back, I guess I was demonstrative or something. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Did you come from a funny family? Boy, uh, you, you know, yes, uh, it, it, me and my dad, uh, you know, my dad was quite a character. Uh, you know, he was uh, old school, and uh, he was, you know, World War II combat veteran in Burma and stuff, and uh, yeah. 27 months overseas, and he's a like colonel in the Air Force and stuff, and he liked to run, uh, now, I was the oldest of, uh, uh, I had four brothers and sisters, and I was the oldest. Yeah, and uh, he tried to run our house like it was a military base or something, you know. <laughs> and, yeah. and so uh, he was always yelling at me, and I was always yelling back. And uh, uh, it got pretty uh, well through junior high and high school and college. You know, my friend said, "Well, let's go over and you know you make your dad mad and stuff like that." <laughs> and everybody liked to see my because my mom kept him. You know, from getting out of line, you know, but, uh, Bob, settle down, you know, but, uh, uh, and he always called me names, not my brothers and sisters. He would always call me names like, uh, you're worthless, and, uh, 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 you know, uh, leech and stuff, like, you know, a lot of leeches in Burma and stuff, and, uh, he always had names to call me. Some of them were pretty inventive, you know, like he'd call, hey, hot shot. Dot the eye, you know, like hot shit. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty inventive, Bob. You know, that's a, I called him Bob since I was like eight years old and stuff. But anyhow, uh, looking around at all my friends, and uh, I don't think anybody else had a dad like him. Sounds <laughs> like it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I remember uh, 
parking in front of the car, uh, down the street, you know, there's three or four of us in the car having beer, you know, we are under 21 and stuff, and uh, you'd see my dad up in the window because we had this house kind of overlooking neighborhood, and he'd be playing the piano and drinking beer, and uh, they'd be saying, God, nobody's like your dad, you know. I think they had a party just uh, look at, you know, being around us sometimes because, uh, anyhow, but that's where I came from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Did you um, watch the Ed Sullivan show and the Tonight Show and all of that? God, you said something about Ed Sullivan. Okay, so uh, in in high school, I was going to get to this later, but since you brought it up, uh, in high school, uh, I uh, was watching TV one, you know, I mean, impressions, I, I graduated in high school in 69, okay? Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of impressionist back in those days, and everybody was trying to do John Wayne or Jimmy Stewart or James Cagney and stuff. And one night I saw uh, three people, you know, Frank Gorshin and, uh, you know, uh, other people, you know, uh, they did Ed Sullivan. And right. so that, I, you know, I, I uh, said, well, uh, the next day at school I was going to try to do my impression of Ed Sullivan. And boy, it was a hit. I mean, I just <laughs> put my arms, you know, made my neck scrunch into my arms and stuff. And uh, next week in our shoe, whatever I said. But, uh, you know, teachers were calling me down to their classes and uh, to do Ed Sullivan. And uh, I became a, you know, look, this is before the internet. You had to entertain yourself, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, I'm old enough to remember when there was no internet. I, I, I was lucky to get internet about 16 years into my life. <laughs> well, I wish uh, I, that was a long way for me. I, I didn't think I got it about the last uh, 10 years or something. But uh, anyhow, uh, uh, but that, 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 uh, I, I did that Ed Sullivan. It became, uh, I am, am seed. Oh, let's see. Uh, there's a Boys League Assembly. And, uh, uh, there's a dead spot, you know, wait for somebody, and somebody yells, Hey, Hilbert, do your head solving, you know, so uh, I, I said, so money, you know, and so I got up, and I think I got $15 in quarters or something. It was my, my first, you know, uh, paid engagement, but... <laughs> 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 and uh, I emceed the uh, uh, senior year. I uh, emceed the uh, senior day awards or something, at Ed Sullivan, or, you know, kind of like that, and... Uh, of course, Johnny Carson was a god, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. I remember one joke, one joke that I did, uh, see, senior day, I says, uh, uh, a picture, uh, these are some things that I uh, I collected over the year, over the last year, I says, here's a picture that appears at first glance to be a smoke grenade going up amongst a group of long-haired student demonstrators, but on closer examination, it is actually the girls' restroom during any lunch period. So, <laughs> I don't know, remember. <laughs> so that was the first comedy you did, huh? <laughs> really, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I had a suit on and everything, and... Uh, who were who your favorite comedians you watched on those shows? Oh, back in the... Now, this is back in the 60s. Yeah. Me and my friend Don, it was always... He called me up, I called him up, hey, uh, George Carlin's on uh, Ed Sullivan, George Carlin's on Mike Douglas. Now, this is when George Carlin was, you know, regular. Yeah. Robert Klein was regular. Right. Richard Pryor was regular. He was Cosby. <laughs> What's that? He was Cosby in those days. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, you watch Robert Klein and uh, George Carlin and uh, Richard Pryor being regular in the 60s, and then in the, the 70s, like at college, when I went to the college, uh, the, hey, see that guy, that real long-haired guy on Johnny Carson? Well, that George Carlin wants the hair down to his, you know, shoulders and stuff. So uh, everybody was going through transitions at the time, and uh, yeah. so do they. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, did, yeah, you probably saw guys like the old, you know, Borscht Belt guys like Jack Carter, Jonathan Winter, Shecky Green. <laughs> Jack Carter, yeah, 
Jack Carter, you know, he, he, me and my friends still even talk about Jack Carter mm -hmm. uh, because uh, uh, he married, uh, who's the guy, uh, 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 Bert Baccarat's ex-wife. Yeah. I mean, can you believe it? Bert Baccarat's, you know, sexy and good looking and uh, he makes a song for her and, and stuff like that. And then Jack Carter, you know, I mean, Jack Carter stole his wife. I mean, she's, yeah, I just, I just, the way Jack Carter he farts on my leg, it's so funny. It, that just had to, you know, I, I don't know. I, I I, it's hard for me to picture Jack uh, Carter uh, stealing Burt Bacharach's wife, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've been lucky. I've interviewed two guys who were in the Borscht Belt on their on its way out, uh, John Biner and Hank Garrett. John Biner was uh, uh, really another one. He was one of the guys who did that Sullivan that night. Frank Gorshin and John Biner and Rich Little, I think. Yeah. Were, you know, I said, hey, I got to do this, you know. But uh, John Bynum was, we always look for him, too. But you know what's really funny? Mm -hmm. uh, on YouTube, uh, you go back, I mean, they got lots of stuff you, can, you see on YouTube. And on Ed Sullivan, they got stuff from the early 60s. And they got Johnny Carson, this is the Fourth of the Night show. Uh, he's getting up and doing his routine, and uh, John Biner's doing it. And I'm telling you. Johnny Carson hardly got any laughs. I mean, he was, you know, I don't know, I don't know. You know, he still had the same diction, the same pronunciation, but he didn't get that many laughs. But, hey, he had something, I'll tell you that, you know. But I'm telling you, you know, uh, what? you just look at these old uh, records of people and, hey, yeah, I mean, he was, he was he was definitely a personality, you know. Yeah, well, hey, he, he walked on water as far as I was concerned, you know. Uh, but I'm just saying, starting out there, I don't know. It just, you know. <laughs> yeah. Where are you from originally? Oh, uh, Portland, Oregon. Okay, you're an Oregon guy. So, so after high school, I mean, did you decide that you were going to pursue stand-up? Yes, uh, Tommy, uh... See, I was a stooge all, oh, I, I'm sorry, didn't, didn't get to this. I was uh, about sophomore year in high school. Mm -hmm. I was, uh, uh, let's see, I was on the baseball team, the JV baseball team. Uh, and the previous year, I was at uh, Meadow Park, which is junior high, and mm -hmm. I had the highest batting average on the team, you know, 391 or something. And so, but the JV coach at Sunset did not like me, and I got cut. But I have the statistics sheet uh, with my 391 on there, and I went to the head coach, uh, mm. who was my math teacher, and he put me back on the team. Well, the JV coach didn't like that, and he belittled me at every opportunity. And, uh, you know, the, like the uh, unip they were one uniform short, well, it was me. I was the one who had to go uh, in muddy practice clothes to the games and stuff like that. Uh, and so after about, uh, you know, a couple of weeks of doing that, I said uh, to the guy, the guy who says, I'm going to tell, tell Coach Gleason I'm, I'm quitting and I'm through being his stooge. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, the guys were out in the hallway as I was uh, in uh, Coach Gleason's office uh, you know, quitting and saying I'm not going to be your stooge, and they were running up and down the hallway there yelling stooge stooge and uh and name stuck so i was stooge all through high school and a lot of them went to college with me so it was uh a stooge all through the university of oregon right. in fact the first guy i met at college was dan fouts you know the football player oh wow uh, and he was in the room next to me in the dorms uh, you'd probably see him today and say hey you know stooge yeah sure you know <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I was the stooge. And then, uh, we're, oh, okay, so after I graduated, now this is, yeah, this is really, uh, I was just at the right time, Tommy. Mm -hmm. uh, after I graduated, uh, I think in 74, <clears throat> I was studying for a real estate test. And uh, I take it, they had to do it, was very intensive, you know, for six weeks or something to take this real estate test. And so in the afternoon, I would turn on Merv Griffin. 
and then uh, he would have comics come out there uh, and do stuff, you know, for five minutes. And I said, well, I can do that, and I can do that, you know. And then mm-hmm. Freddie Prinze came out, first yeah. time I'd ever seen him. I said, good grief, I can't do that. I mean, he had so much charisma. Uh, and uh, so, but I decided myself, hey, I'm going to go to Los Angeles in the fall, and I'm going to, oh, they kept mentioning the comedy store. Right. Comedy store. Man, I love that name, that comedy store. Wow. And so uh, I told a couple of friends what I was going to do. Not, not a lot of people. And, but uh, so uh, later on that year, uh, that, that summer, I think in September, well, Freddie Prinze was uh, opening for Lou Rawls in a concert in Portland. Mm-hmm. So I went down and, uh, you know, waited for Freddie to show up in his cab and, uh, hey, uh, you got a couple of seconds I could talk to you about comedy and stuff? So come, come on after the show and we'll talk. So I, after the show, I spent about 20 minutes talking with Freddie Prince, who was still pretty unfamous. You know, show was, was out yet. Chico and the Man was still a month away. And so uh, we talked, and he was a really good guy. And, uh, he, you know, he, he talked about, re- he thought he was a reincarnation of Lenny Bruce. Yeah. But uh, Lenny Bruce had died in about, that was 66, and Freddie's probably about 12 years old at the time. So I didn't know if reincarnation worked like that, but hey, you know, what do I know, you know? So I just... <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Freddie, no problem. But uh, I, I came down to Los Angeles in uh, late 1974. And now we also have, my family has a big celebrity in the family. Huh. Uh, my grandpa's kid brother was Roy Williams. Uh, oh, yeah. Roy Williams is. I, I kind of know who he is, but uh, tell my listeners who he is. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, he, uh, he is the, the big fat guy on the original Mickey Mouse Club, you know, with Annette. And right. Annette. I've talked to two of the Musketeers that are still alive. Wow. Wow, great. <laughs> well, Roy was, uh, you know, my grandpa's kid brother. And uh, they, uh, he came down in about 19... 19- 20 or something, and he, 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 he was going, he's a big guy, he's a big guy, a big husky guy, and he was said, the, the biography I, I read on him said he had that athletic scholarship to USC, but he turned that down to go to art school for Walt Disney, so he was very early on with Walt Disney, and then, uh, but if he'd have gone to USC on a football scholarship, he'd have probably been on the same team as John Wayne and Ward Bond, you know. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, anyhow, uh, he, uh, he, you know, when the show came, now he was with Disney out to the 30s and 40s and stuff, and uh, when the show came on, I mean, I was like five or six years old, you know, I'm in there watching it, and mom comes in and says, that's your Uncle Roy, you know, and I remember I was probably five, six years old, and uh, geez, you know. So uh, yeah, I, and he uh, he he see Walt said, "All right, I'm doing the show, the Mickey Mouse Club, and I want somebody fat and funny looking on Roy. Roy, that's you. <laughs> and oh, by the way, Roy, uh, make the kids a hat. Guess what hat he made." The Mickey Mouse hat. That was my guess, yeah. <laughs> That's probably the most popular hat in the history of man. Yeah. You know? uh, and so uh, the, he invented that dang hat. So uh, I don't get it. I wonder if I'd probably get in Disneyland if I go to it and say, hey, uh, you know, I uh, I was a, you know, Roy was my grandpa's kid brother, you know. But, uh, uh, yeah, so, so, uh, when now I came down to the comedy store in seventy four, late seventy four. Mm-hmm. Uh, now Roy was still alive, but uh, 
you know, Disney, I don't know if you remember, you probably don't remember this, but back then in the 70s, I mean, Disneyland was squeaky clean. Yeah. I mean, I think I remember, you know, ridings of, you know, surfers or something trying to get in with long hairs, stuff like that. Right. You know, squeaky, squeaky clean. So I was going to tell Roy to come down and see me. I mean, gosh, I had 10 minutes of dick jokes surrounded by <laughs> five minutes of toilet humor. I mean, <laughs> you know, I've been kicked out of the family or something, you know, so. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So you get to the comedy store late '74, and let, let's talk about who was there. Well, at the time, the first time I, I when I came down, uh, I remember going to the comedy store the first night just to see it, and the first people I seen were Pip, Kelly Monteith. Mm -hmm. and uh, Johnny Dark and Steve Bluestein. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it was, so then later on that week, they had hot luck night. I think it was Sunday or Monday night. And so uh, I got a good time spot around 9 o'clock, and it's the first time I'd ever got up on stage, you know, uh, in front of a real audience. And yeah, I did very well. I, geez, very well. So I, the fact, this guy named, do you know who Danny Moore is? Yeah, I, I talked to him earlier this year. Okay, well, Danny and me have a past history. Mm -hmm. And so uh, Danny was the host that night. And as I got on stage, somebody comes up and grabs me by the arm, it's Danny. And he says, get your hair cut. People want to see your ears. You know, it's yeah. like that. <laughs> Uh, yet, uh, another incident with Danny, uh, well, this gets out of here for a second, but, uh, it was a comedy store, and mm -hmm. the 1977 type, or 878, around there, I was walking through the original room, and I heard Danny on stage, and he was talking about, uh, in an incident in his life, he says, yeah, it's a Royal airport, uh, and they blew up a plane, and killed 35 people, and uh, I'm the only Mexican within 10,000 miles, and the police are jacking me up because I look like an Arab. <laughs> well, I was there, too. Tommy, I, mean, I was there, too. Yeah. Uh, after I'd been to Europe and Russia and stuff like this, I had been at Royal Airport when the explosion happened, killed 35 people, and uh, uh, I got... A I got the only picture I've uh, seen of, of it actually being on fire, the plane burning up, the people inside of it. Wow. But, uh, but I said, Jesus, Danny, you were there? And I, I just showed you basically what a small world it is, <laughs> you know, yeah. a small world is. But anyhow, back to the comedy store, uh, Potluck Night and stuff. And so, you know, there was, in 1974, the Comedy Store was the only comedy nightclub uh, east of New York. Uh, you know, they had the improv back there. And because uh, the, the improv in, in Los Angeles didn't really get started until early in 1975. And so the quality stage time, uh, you really you had to get on at the Comedy Store, get a good spot yeah the comedy store there are all these other clubs that had comedy spots i went to them once or twice and never went back because they were you know the pits yeah you know, it's six people in the audience and who cares you know i mean you know, you can't develop an act and stuff like that but that's the way it was and then the the, uh, the improv came down and they had their own potluck night so I think there's Sunday and Monday night at the comedy store in the improv. But still, uh, yeah, it, uh, after six, seven months of that, you know, I got tired of this uh, lack of stage time and decided to move back to Portland. Ooh. So I moved back up there, and uh, that's, you know, uh, early in 70, uh, late 75, I mean, early in 75. I, for, I, my real estate license, I joined a real company and stuff, and, uh, but after a month or two, you know, I, the itch for comedy was too strong, and I was the only comedian in town, really, uh, mm -hmm. except 
there's one guy, his name is Brian Bressler, mm -hmm. and uh, he had been on Laugh-In, and he lived next to one of my cousins. And so I got with him, and, uh, you know, he, I opened for him a time or two, but uh, and then he, he played most of the resorts. But uh, uh, I, I kept doing the uh, these comedy spots at bars around town. And uh, I would put up posters, you know, uh, uh, saying, uh, you know, the, the, yeah, handmade posters, you know, uh, George Carlin and uh, uh, Freddie Prinze and Richard Pryor will not be at the Euphoria Tavern. Uh, but Greg Hilders, I, I just made up these posters, you know, I had to put them on, uh, you know, uh, telephone poles and stuff around town and stuff. And, uh, but once again, I, I was the only comedian in town. There was no comedy scene, you know, so. Uh, right. But then back in late, uh, oh, I talked to my, my friend, his name is Gordon McClee. Mm -hmm. And he was uh, the piano player. Right. At the comedy store. And I. Before uh, Mike, Be before said, Mike uh, Becker. What's that? Before Mike Becker. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. No, he, he was the original guy. Yeah. Uh, Mike Becker came along about 82 or something like that. Right. But uh, and then he wanted a man, you know, like Mitzi's right hand man and stuff like that. But, uh, right. Uh, anyway, I, I said to, you know, this is why I'm in Portland. I call up Gordon and say, hey, Gordon, uh, so are any new comedians down there? You know, I mean, comedians were not a dime a dozen. They were, you know, pretty, you know, there's 100, 100 200 in the country just about. And they said, yeah, there's a couple of really funny guys, uh, Dave Letterman and Jay Leno. <laughs> <laughs> the first time I'd heard their names, you know. So yeah. uh, so I came back down in uh, late 76, October of 76, I think. Mm -hmm. And I went, now the Westwood store, Mitzi had opened the Westwood store uh, in late, earlier in 76. And there's a lot more spots. But for, you know, I mean, I came in and Mitzi, uh, she says very warmly, she says, Greg, you know, and uh, hey, you know, and uh, I became a regular and uh, got spots at the, at the, most of them at the Westwood store. And uh, that was uh, really, you know, that was still in the late 70s. It, it, outside of like Jimmy Walker, he was a star and... Uh, uh, you know, of course, Freddie Prinze was, and then uh, uh, Steve Landisberg was on Barney Miller show. Yeah, there was, you know, you you weren't, you uh, there wasn't anybody famous, you know, uh, and so mm -hmm. I'd be, I mean, you know, the other comedians would be like, you know, Bill Hicks. He was, I don't know, barely set, eighteen years old. Yeah. He was a really good guy, you know, funny and stuff like that, but. Who would know that he would go on to become like a legend? You know, and right. die tragically very young. But, uh, and then, uh, 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 oh, uh, well, even Sam Kinison and Andrew Clay, you know, they were there, but they, uh, yeah. they weren't really that funny and stuff. They developed. Oh, yeah. You know, and so you uh, saw some interesting. Uh, things you know, Michael Keaton, Michael, Michael. He was originally Michael Douglas. We used to go back and forth. You know, I mean, he'd yeah. be up and I'd be up or something like that. You know, the way Mitzi programmed and stuff. And so then he went on to uh, become Michael. He was his original name was Michael Douglas from mm -hmm. Pittsburgh. Yep. And uh, but Michael Douglas was you know Kirk Douglas's son on the streets of San Francisco. Yep. Remember, remember that bit he did about the Bazooka Joe bubblegum rapper. Yes, that yes. I love that bit. It kills me. You know, he did an evening at the Improv. And it's on YouTube of him doing that bit. It just it kills me. You know, because <laughs> uh, he he wasn't a strong stand up right, but that bit is just way way too funny. <laughs> well, he's, he had some very funny stuff. Yeah. Uh, you know, like sticking the popsicle down your sister's pants or something. I don't know. You know. Or, yeah. Anyhow, the guy was. You know, I mean, uh, but he developed into. Uh, a great actor. He won the Academy Award. Uh, you know, uh, 
I think he was nominated, he, but he didn't he win. Was yeah. There, you know, so. Uh, yeah. And of course, there was a lot of obscure guys I've interviewed, like Bob DeSimone. And, um, yes, yes. Bob DeSimone. The first time I heard that name in several, uh, several decades, I think. Yes. No, Bob was also, you know, I have in my hands here, let me get this here. Mm -hmm. I have the original, probably the, the only copy of the Strikers list in 1979. Right. They handed it out at a meeting and stuff, and everybody else threw it away. And I put this on Facebook, you know, six or seven years ago. But uh, I, as far as I know, I've got the only one. Wow. And there's, see, go down the names list. He had I'll, some Kipadada, um, mm. Byron Allen, uh, uh, Bruce Baum, Mike Binder, Sandra Bernhardt. Um, Tom Sharp. What's that? Was Tom Sharp there? Yes, yes. See, I'm yeah. looking to yeah, Tom Sharp. You got his phone number four six four seven six eight eight three one or four seven nine three nine. See, he had he was staying at his mom's house or something. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Johnny Dark. Uh, uh, I'm just going over. Leo Mitch. Gallagher. That's Gallagher. You know? Yeah. Tom Beeson. Uh, Tom. Yeah. Jack Purdue. I think Jack Purdue came a little later. I don't see his name on the list, and I don't know. See, there was about 100, 150 comedians. There's about 100 on this list. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Jay Leno and Gary Shandling and Paul Mooney and uh, George Miller, and uh, uh, you, you'd recognize a lot of them. Uh, uh -huh. Bill Schreiner. Uh, but uh, uh, what were we talking about? Uh, uh, Whose who name did you mention again? Uh, there's Tom Sharp. Yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, I forgot my train of thought there. Was Mark, uh, was Mark Scheffler there? Mark Scheffler? Oh, yes, yes. Yes, yeah. yes, he is. I've talked to him. Very funny guy. Yes. Yes, all the, I mean, most of these guys are my Facebook friends. You know, Diane Nichols and... Uh, oh, I love Diane. She's great. Oh. Carrie, yeah. Carrie Snow. What's that? Carrie Snow. God, well, she was on the list, but Carrie Snow is, uh, well, she's a good, a good friend of mine. You know, uh, I mean, these are, I look back on this days, you know, I mean, I've never made it big or nothing, but I mean, I look back at the experience of being there during the 70s and 80s, and uh, there's no time like that in history and, uh, or, you know, comedy and stuff, and uh, I just, it was a pleasure to be there. It was it was just a revolution of comedy, you know. Uh, people who aren't very educated about the history of comedy, they wonder how it started. Well, it started with the comedy store, you know. Um, I mean, I talked to you know I talked to Murray Langston last week, right, or, yeah. or or two weeks ago, and you know he you know he had a, he didn't like Mitzi. They had you know some trouble and stuff, and he said to me, he said. Mitzi didn't didn't uh, change comedy. Johnny Carson did when he moved from New York to L.A. I, I, you know, I think they both changed it. N it wasn't just Johnny Carson. It was Johnny Carson and Mitzi Shore. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Johnny Carson, I, I, like I said, you know, in the nineteen sixty two on Ed Sullivan, he wasn't that funny, but he was a god. Uh, I mean, I I would uh, you know, you know, shiny shoes <laughs> daily. Uh, and, but he came out in the 72, and I, around there, yeah. that's when the comedy store opened up, too. So it was, uh, the, you know, without, it would have been in New York before. You know, I mean, it had been like the improv would have been back in New York, and uh, but Merv Griffin and Johnny Carson and the comedy store, and I, I, yeah, when I heard that name, the comedy store, I mean, just lights went off in my head, you know. I mean, Jesus, what the heck is that, you know? Right. Uh, was 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 Donna Kaufman there? Who's that now? Donna Kaufman. Donna Kaufman. She yeah she was she was a comedy store comic and then she, um, 
she helped Paul Rubens develop the Pee Wee Herman show at the Groundlings, and then she executive produced his um, HBO special of it, right? And yeah. then she she went she after she got screwed over by him, she went into journalism and celebrity journalism. She's always got something negative to say about somebody in <laughs> show business. I, uh, I don't think I uh, yeah. recognize uh, the name uh, Donna Kaufman. Yeah. Yeah, I mean she's she's just you know I mean she's just a footnote of the comedy store history you know she's a great lady overall, but um, I've talked to her I've talked to her uh, uh, of course Mitchell Walters who just passed I never got to talk with him but uh, you know Mitch Walters thank yeah. God I, I had an opportunity to say goodbye to him uh, now we weren't best of buddies back in the the days I mean look at a lot of those guys were in the. <laughs> You know, some very serious drugs and stuff. Cocaine, yeah. <laughs> and I was, uh, went down to Orange County and stuff. But, uh, uh, I saw, see, Argus Hamilton has got, had a show in the year and a half before this pandemic hit to close up the store and stuff. Oh, yeah, I used to watch it. In fact, I saw you on there. Oh, did you? Great, great. Well, yeah. <laughs> uh, 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 this, uh, but Argus uh, had, well, Mitch, Mitch Walters was at this comedy store to see, uh, be interviewed by Mike Binder for that HBO series, oh, the, or Showtime series, whatever, on the comedy store, which is great. Yeah. God, somebody got it right. Uh, you saw that, right? I did. I was disappointed that you weren't interviewed, but I did see it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was too, but what the heck, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to get uh, that, that uh, sheet uh, of the... Uh, Hundred strikers on to Mike Binder, but uh, and I didn't use it. So, oh, thank you. He did. This is the first time that somebody's really captured the essence of the comedy store. And yeah. uh, but one night, Mitch Walters was at the store down the, the aisle there, and he says, uh, "I mean, you know, down the hallway there. Have you ever been to the comedy store?" I've been there um, at least three, four times. Yeah. Okay, so you want to sing the the you know the the alley down or the you know about the whatever between the main room and the original room. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And uh, so Mitch Walters down. Mitch was all, you know, he, he was uh, very fragile, and uh, he he uh, so he wouldn't come down the stairs. I said, Mitch, Marcus wants you down there. And he says, because uh, I, I came every week, you know. Yeah. And uh, me and Joey Gaynor and Lou Deck and stuff. But, oh, I love those uh, guys. Yeah. But, but Mitch <laughs> couldn't make it down the steps. So that's how yeah. fragile he was. And, and so I said, hey, you know, love you. And, uh, and then he died uh, last year. And, uh, you know, but hey, you know, it's, uh, you, you know, I. You know, uh, have you ever heard about the comedy store ghost? Oh, I, I know those stories. Uh, my friend Lori Jacobson was a waitress there, and she tells me all the time about those. Oh, great. Well, uh, see, in about 1985, uh, now I, was, I was painting uh, for Mitzi. Uh, I, uh, the reason I got that job, the painting for her was, uh, oh, in about 1980, uh, oh, See, it was, there's no clubs anywhere until, right. you know, the comedy store and then uh, the improv and the laugh stops in the L.A. type stuff. Yeah. The Ice House and stuff. And uh, then New York had the, the comic strip and the uh, improv. But then they started springing up comedy stores, uh, I mean, comedy clubs, uh, like Starbucks. Because I guess it was Make Me Laugh or something. Mm. Uh, I'm not sure what, what, what it was. Mm -hmm. But 1980, people were traveling, yeah. and uh, John Fox, uh, you know John Fox, don't you? Yeah, yeah, he was he was a crazy guy from what I've been told. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, God bless him, God bless him. So he he uh, was a painter, and he Mitzi had him painting a bunch of stuff, you know, at the comedy store. And so he says, "Hey, Greg, I'm going to uh, I'm going to be going out on the road." And so Mitch is going to need a painter. Uh, you paint, so why don't you apply? So I applied and got it. And that led to all sorts of adventures. And uh, always being around the comedy store and oh, whatever stuff was going the nonsense was going on. It was great. And uh, so, uh, but one Saturday afternoon, one Saturday morning, uh, 
I'm up there painting the kitchen at the comedy store. And then they had this Thai cleanup crew that would, you know, do stuff. And uh, this guy come, he's about 20 years old, and he said to me in broken English, about two years ago, I, I saw a man's head in smoke over there. <laughs> and I point toward the main room doors, and I go, Jesus, you know, and yeah. oh, uh, what's this all about, you know? And so as I, you know, time and on, I heard more comedy store ghost stories. And so uh, when Facebook came up, and Facebook has been great for whatever Mark Zuckerberg crimes Mark Zuckerberg has done, you know, uh, it, the Facebook thing has really got the comedy clan together again. And uh, I just say that really the, the comedians' pages are the most, probably the most entertaining in the country. Because you can do something from 40 years ago, or you can do something last night. Yeah. You know what I'm saying, Tommy? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so, I mean, if a guy was in World War II, hey, that's great, you know, for World War II guys, you know, but it happened there in two or, you know, two or three years, you know, and, uh, or a baseball player, that's great for the, but you're dealing with usually, uh, 10 years or something, uh, what you're, you know, but the comedian is very entertaining, interesting, and, uh, anyhow, uh, uh, so, uh, I put on Facebook, mm -hmm. has anybody ever seen any ghosts, or, you know, on Facebook, I mean, I never really talked about it before, yeah. and it's Halloween, stuff like that, and so, uh, gosh, I got lots of, uh, comments, uh, all affirmative, and uh, I remember stuff like uh, John Kring. Uh, John Kring, uh, he was a comedian back in the 80s. And uh, he uh, was answering the phones one Saturday, the only person in the store. And then he hears a piano playing mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the main room. And so he goes, uh, excuse me, who's there? You know, and nobody answers. So he goes down and looks in. And there's a guy dressed in 40s clothes playing the piano. And, uh, you know, John Crank turned around and uh, says it was a long time before I went back in that room again. You know, uh, he was spooked. And uh, so, uh, uh, now, do you know what Taylor Negron was? Oh, yeah, I loved him, yeah. Okay, so Taylor Negron's passed. But a uh, comedian was named Steve Moore. He used to be a p piano player at the store, and mm -hmm. uh, he was a comedian. And he passed, uh, you know, four or five years ago, six years ago, something. And I was at the memorial, and uh, uh, Taylor Negron got up and said, you know, it was in the main room at the store, and he says, uh, I was one day looking for Steve Moore one afternoon, and I heard uh, the piano playing in the main room, and I went down in, and there was a guy in 40s clothes, playing the piano. And it's the same story as John Crank. I mean, whoa. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> and then so Jamie Monroe. You know Jamie Monroe? I've, I've heard the name, yeah. Okay, well, he's a, 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 you know, he's a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, back in the day, he uh, was uh, uh, playing the belly room, which is upstairs. And so he was before the show, you know, I mean, before, you know, he was going on and stuff, and he was going over some notes or something, this kind of this aisle cob or something off the, and then he's, uh, then somebody approached him. And so he says, what is this? Is this another comedian? Is this somebody in the audience? He looks up, and some guy, and the guy turned around and took one or two steps, and, or to Jamie, vanished into thin air. That's what he said on my post. I mean, you know, you, you can go after him. What are you talking about? Well, <laughs> that's what Jamie said. So, uh, and people like uh, uh, Lou Deck and uh, uh, Joey Gaynor, mm -hmm. they have told the uh, immense story. Well, they did a big story on uh, uh, Joey Gaynor and Blake Clark. Robert Stack did a thing on America's Greatest Mysteries back in the 90s. Oh. Uh, where... Uh, their story was, uh, you know, about the ghost of the comedy store. So, uh, right. But then you say you you read that book. I uh, I probably should get that book because I then heard a lot of the waitresses. Yeah, you know, I like to see that their side of the story. But uh, yeah, yeah. Ghost of the comedy store. <laughs>
Of, of all the guys, though, that were there that didn't make it, like, who do you think should have made it that was really, really good? You know, I was thinking about that uh, originally. Well, he, John Fox, God bless him, he was, uh, all the guys wanted to be, I mean, he was a, you know, party monster, okay? I mean, he was, you know, but he, he was, uh, he, he was uh, had the good looks, but not, you know, he had manly good looks, and the chicks liked him, and the guys liked him. But he is he was his own worst enemy, and I, I uh, yeah. died, uh, you know, uh, you know, several years ago from cancer, and uh, but uh, I think if he wasn't just a blazing party monster and put his nose to the grindstone, uh, he could have made it. He could have made it. Yeah. You hear people talking about him like a restaurant. Oh, the shot talk. Yeah, you know, I mean, he didn't have the greatest. I mean, he wasn't inventive like a lot of comedians. I mean, John Fox uh, wasn't the most inventive comedian, but he captivated the place being with his personality, you know? Right. I mean, I, li- I like that uh, Tim Thomerson should have made it. He was brilliant, I thought. Well, when I was there in 74, 75, mm-hmm. uh, Tim Thomerson, yes. He was uh, the original, uh, original. He won the Lenny Award uh, they gave out one time for the best stand-up comedian in 1975 or whatever, 74, yeah. I guess. But uh, he, yeah, he was, uh, he was really uh, the bomb until Robin Williams and uh, Jay Leno and uh, uh, Letterman showed up. But then Tim quit comedy. I'm not sure... What year he quit? I don't think there was much of him in uh, after seventy six or seventy seven, seventy you know, like that. He, he became an actor and he was pretty successful, but never. You think he would have uh, be like, uh, you know, he was you know real manly and stuff like that, you know. <laughs> yeah. I thought he would have been a bigger star than he was, but he, you know, I don't think, don't think he's missed too many meals, but. He went, yeah. yeah, he went on Letterman um, uh, in the 80s, you know. I think the last one he did was like in 87 or something like that, and then he got out of it. But I thought he was just brilliant. You know, he called David Bowie, David Blowy. <laughs> oh, absolutely, absolutely. No, I, I, yeah. he was, look at, everybody would stop when Tim Thomerson was on because he captivated the room. I mean, there's like I said, uh, Freddie Prinze had the most charisma that... Uh, I think I've seen uh, as a comedian, especially in the younger, you know, I mean, he was only there for two or three years, whatever. But uh, Tim Thomerson, you know, Robin Williams, they they were up there, but not greater. I don't think greater than, uh, I mean, that's my opinion. That's my opinion. You know, I yeah. thought Jay Leno was on, uh, Freddie hosted a show, and Jay Leno was on there. Now, this is Jay Leno in 76. Uh, Elaine, uh, Elaine Boozler and, and Thomerson was on there, too. Oh, okay. And, uh, uh, I mean, I looked at it, and I said, God, uh, uh, Freddie's just blowing Jay away. I mean, Jesus. I mean, you know, I mean, Jesus. And Elaine Boozler... Yeah. Uh, I want to address this one. Uh, you know, I I keep hearing this. I I mentioned this to Elaine Boozler at another memorial. <laughs> Jesus, I've been to so many memorials yeah. uh, a couple of years ago. But, uh, uh, you know, I used to love to watch her back in 77. You know, she, uh, the, the first tier of comedians were Dave Letterman and Jay Leno. Like, the, they were mm. the Mickey Mantle and Willie Mays of our generation there at the store. Yeah. And then the second tier were Richard Lewis and Elaine Boozler. Uh, I just love to watch Elaine Boozler on a packed house uh, at Westwood on a Friday night or something. You know, she was just great. Mm-hmm. And so I hear these things, you know, like Jerry Lewis said something in the 70s and other people have done, th- women aren't funny. Yeah. What are you talking about? I, I mean... Know. You know, I mean, hey, I understand a lot of the prejudice, but what are you talking about? The, the women aren't funny. I think he's he was being biased because I saw him work with some funny ladies that, you know, he, he would have had to have proved to have worked with, you know? Oh, Jerry Lewis? Yeah. 
Well, when I grew up, you know, I mean, Mary Tyler Moore and Lucy, of course, and hey, Phyllis Diller is a stand-up. Uh, was great on uh, Johnny Carson. I mean, I laughed at her, you know. And yeah. so I get down to the comedy store, and uh, uh, well, there's a lot more uh, guy comedians at the time. You know, that was the, the way it was. But uh, uh, geez, uh, Elaine Boozer, then Diane Nichols was right below her. Uh, she came about in the '77, I believe. L- Lois Brom, uh, Lois Bromfield. Yes, yes. I, yes. Lo- I love her. She's one of my favorite people in the world. Great, great. Yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> Lois was married to Steve Moore. Yep. And now she's a lesbian. <laughs> What's that? And now she's a lesbian. <laughs> well, yeah, there was, uh, well, anyhow. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, she, she's one of my favorite people in the world. You know, we, we, we talk all the time. Yeah. She's in Germany or something like that? She's, uh, she's in Germany, yes. Yeah. And she just came out with a memoir, and she talks about the comedy store in it, you know, about, oh, great. about her experiences. You know, it's all about her comedy. That, that's great. You know, I just love to have, uh, uh, you know, just let me, once again, you know, I mean, I'm uh, 70 years old now, geez, but, uh, you know, you just like to look, once again, it's, it's like, it just happened yesterday, I mean, going to the comedy store, and uh, you just kind of, uh, <laughs> uh, you just, you, you know, you kind of apprise the time. I mean, God, that was great. It was great, you know, I mean, uh, it was all great, but, you know, it's, I'm glad I was there. You know what I'm saying? Exactly, exactly. Of course, Vic Dunlop, oh my God, he was brilliant. He should have made it. Well, he was a guy, uh, when I first hit the store in 74, he was in a group called, oh, uh, Natural, I, Natural know, Gas. Okay. Yeah. And so then he got shot, and he was a stand-up, and uh, he, him and Bill Kirkenbauer, they won this first comedy contest, I think, at the Ice House mm-hmm. in 77. I think Bill was first and uh, Vic was second. And Darren Johnson, I think, was third or something. But uh, 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 but Vic was, once again, when you, sometimes it's, you know, your, your physicality, Works for you. <laughs> I'm saying it looks funny, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I reached out. I reached out to Jack Grayman recently. He's on LinkedIn, and all he did was view my profile. I don't even think he read my message yet. You know, I, I, I hope I get him. I want to uncover the story of Jackie Bananas. <laughs> yeah, Jack. Uh, he was there. He was there all the time. Uh, you know, and, uh... He was on stage at the Improv the night that it got caught on fire during the strike. Oh, really? Yeah. Uh, Kevin Nealon was bartending. He told the story to Mark Marin a couple years ago. Hey, now, Jack Grayman is on the list I have here as, uh, you know, is 658-6648. That was his number. <laughs> that didn't have area codes there unless you're in Orange County. Uh, but, yeah. uh, you know, that's how different life was back then you know yeah so so like what it, during the strike i mean how how nuts was it okay uh during the strike we mm. had all these oh yeah i'll tell you we had all these meetings yeah you know once a week or something like that and uh, i would come up from orange county and stuff and i uh one actually one night i was uh you know you there are pictures in the paper, you know, uh, Bill Kirkenbauer had this sign that said, yeah. no funny, no no money, no funny, you know, or something like that, really funny, very funny. And, but, uh, uh, I wasn't in the battlefield, uh, you know, uh, uh, like, like, there's about 20 people, Argus, mm. and uh, Joey Gaynor and uh, Lou Deck, they were uh, with Mitzi. You know, and they were uh, opposed to the strikers, Ollie Joe and stuff like that. Right. And then uh, uh, everybody else was kind of outside in the picket line. And uh, uh, I think the strike ended with when when uh, Jay Leno got somebody random done. Not seriously, but he kind of got bumped. I wasn't there that night, so something got run over by a car, or but no injuries or something. But I think it was Biff. I think or something. And I think Biff Maynard hit him with the car or something like that. Okay. Wow. 
Yeah. Yeah. He was he uh, was one of Tim Thomerson's at the time. He was uh, one of. Uh, I heard at the time. I said, "Well, Vic Maynard writes all his material. Tim Thomerson stuff." And I don't know if that's the truth or not. As somebody else also was involved with that, but Biff was also a stand-up uh, comedian. And uh, uh, but I could see uh, he was pretty tall, he's about six foot five or something like that. And uh, but so Jay Leno, whatever. But Mitzi called it off. And right. then some people Mitzi had grudges against. Mm-hmm. Uh, or something like that, and uh, one of them was Steve Lebeckin. You remember him? Yeah, as a matter of fact, the first time I ever went to the comedy store, I was walking up that rampway of, of where he landed, and I had a shudder down my back because I knew that's where he landed, you know. I, that whole experience, the first time I went, was very supernatural, you know. I felt the presence of dead comics when I was in the OR. Well, uh, I, I've had a stroke and a heart attack, uh, I have this uh, thing, a genetic condition, oh and I mean, I'm all healthy except for this, I get a, the stroke, a massive stroke and a massive heart attack. I mean, I should be dead. Yeah. But, uh, uh, you know, I, was, I mean, I'm an egomaniac, you know, so I'm always taking care of myself. <laughs> <laughs> it pays to be an egomaniac, but, <laughs> but uh, 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 I forget what I was going to say, but... Uh, oh, about the strike. Yeah, about about the the dead bodies and stuff. Uh, I mean, oh, yeah. Uh, So I was saying in my Facebook post, I said, well, if I got to die, I mean, uh, and I would, uh, you know, be sentenced to suffer eternity in the main room. I take it, you know, or something like that. Yeah. So, so, so some people have said they actually, uh, you know, some psyche guy, uh, Argus talked about this. Uh, she uh, was in the main room and she made a drawing of somebody she saw, and just like Holy Joe. And so, uh, yeah. you know, I mean, hey, who, who knows? But, you know what I'm saying? All the other ghost stories. I mean, I believe in life after death, so uh, what the heck, you know? So, uh, <laughs> yeah. take me. <laughs> Did Mitzi like you? Well, I think so, because uh, I did a lot of stuff for her, you know, uh, later on, uh, you know, being the painter and stuff like that. Right. Uh, you know, so, uh, yeah, it, 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 you know, you're always on edge around Mitzi. I mean, you know, one false move and you're gone or something like that, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, uh, and I didn't do drugs uh, or nothing. I was uh, trying to get the chicks drunk like old-fashioned way, you know, but... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, like I said in, in Messenger, you know, Mark Marin has mentioned, you know, you painted the place, you know, he remembers you when he was a doorman there, and that the first the first time I can remember hearing about you was on the Comedy Store podcast, Rick Ingram, you know, he's known your headshot on the wall forever, he talks about your mustache. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> well, great, uh, you know, it's better, you know, better to be known than unknown, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, well, yeah, I, I was. Uh, uh, yeah, there's two of my. Uh, the last time I checked, there was two of my uh, uh, photos still on the wall because they're getting replaced all the time. So you know, who knows what's happening? But uh, you know, it's just nice to. And I hope Argus to get his show going again. But who knows? You know, it might be a year or two or three. You know, and once again, uh, you know, can you go home again or whatever? But Argus is. Uh, he is so inventive, and uh, uh, he just, uh, uh, you know, oh, and uh, loved going to shows, and, uh, you know, down in the basement there, we, we, when we had the shows and stuff, he yeah, was oh. interesting. Oh, he just cracks me up every day on Facebook. He's writing something really, really original. <laughs> yeah, and it seems like he's more original now. You know, back in the 70s and stuff, I mean, I, I, I you know, I, he was a real coke head back then, I don't think he... He always said, well, I write two jokes a day, you know, and, uh, well, God, he's writing about 20 jokes a day now, you know, <laughs> you know, but since he got off drugs, you know, back in the 80s, you know, and a guy used to come up there, uh, and he'd be coming out of the, uh, uh, in his, you know, in, uh, out of the, uh, dumpster in his white suit, you know, and, uh, I don't know how, you know, eight o'clock on a Saturday morning, you know, here it is, <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Well, you know, they, they say, I mean, you get better as you get older. I mean, you know, George Carlin, even as angry as he got in, in the last years of his life, he got w- way better, I think, you know. Well, you know what, one thing? Uh, I think that George Carlin, I, you know, this is my theory. Mm-hmm. I met George a couple of times, but uh, I went with his wife, and he mm-hmm. really had a nice wife. She was attractive and probably his best friend and stuff like this. And I think she died, you know, whenever in the eight, late eighties or something like that. I'm right. Sure. But uh, I think I think that's when because I went to a show and he was talking about God printing up souls and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. And then he became a stone cold atheist later on. And yeah. I think it was bitter at God. I I just I, I I mean he was he was my once again Johnny Carson George Carlin were my mentors you know, for being a, a comedian and stuff, and uh, I just wish, you know, wish him the best in all cases, but uh, he, yeah, he, he, like I said, angry, but I think it might have something to do with his wife. That's my theory. I, I think so, too. It, it could it could have been. So really qu- quickly, I wanted to ask you, you were on Norman Crosby's, Norm Crosby's The um, Comedy Shop. Yeah, yeah, that was... Uh, yeah. What was that? What was that experience like? Oh, I, I ran across Norm at uh, uh, Sammy Shore's 90th birthday three or four years ago, mm-hmm. and uh, you know it was all packed in the main room and stuff. And uh, hey, Norm, how you doing? You know, you see me on the show and stuff like that. But uh, uh, you know, most of the comedians, I mean, a lot, a lot of the, the comedy store comedians were on that show. You know, say the good opportunity gosh i i i uh well i got a lot of stories to tell you some of the time but uh mm. uh, uh i always got approved for merv griffin and never got on the show because stuff would always happen you know and uh and so it's, it's hey like i say i'll take my life <laughs> as it was but you know there was some uh Missed opportunities or whatever so because i know start Matrano was on the roster too and we just lost him who's that Art Matrano. Art Matrano. God, I loved it. I wish he had more time. Uh, Art Matrano was so great to me. He was, gosh, I almost got to tear up. Uh, Art Matrano, I dropped off a tape in 1979 or 1980, whatever. I didn't know Art was. He lived down the street from Mitzi and, uh, you know, three or four houses down uh, on Doheny. And so uh, I dropped off a tape. And so... I uh, came back to pick it up a week later or something, and Art says, he was very complimentary, very complimentary. And I uh, said, look at your face and stuff and whatever. So he, uh, I'm over at Art's, Art's house, you know, for the next 10 years or kind of thing. You know, I was painting for him, and I'd paint him at these one day and paint at Art the next. And Art, uh, when he would get acting gigs, uh, mm-hmm. like uh, I remember he did an A, he's a villain on A Team. I'd go with Police. him or some Robbie Benson thing. And I'd go with yeah. him and uh, Police Academy. Uh, yeah. That, Police Academy two and three. That made him uh, pretty famous. You know, everybody knew him then. He was a uh, uh, Sergeant Melcher or whatever his name was. Mauser. Uh, yeah, and then uh, one thing I remember is uh, uh, he, he he was doing a uh, uh, a play. Uh, it's called Fatty, after Fatty Arbuckle, down the street from the comedy store. Mm-hmm. And it's about 1987 or 18, something like that. And I go down to watch rehearsals, and uh, Joey Bishop, who's a big star, but uh, yeah. Art said to me, Joey's not here to defend himself, so that, great, I'm not going to have defend, <laughs> I'll come <calm> down on <laughs> <laughs> I've heard nothing but negative things about Joey Bishop. Well, uh, Art says to me, yeah, nobody likes Joey Bishop, you know, and uh, so we were, uh, Joey Bishop starts going, who's that guy, you know, to me, uh, you know, hanging around in rehearsals and stuff, you know, like, Joey, love you, Joey, love you. I mean, he was just, Jesus, what is your problem, man? I mean, uh, you know, you just, Joey, rich and famous, and hey, sleep at night, Joey. <laughs> yeah, I don't know, I'm not, I, hey, does not. But I judge, I guess I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, Greg, I saw your, um, your your improv video that you told me about. It was very funny. And I think uh, with all these great stories you told me today, it's a, it's a, it's a crime that you were not interviewed for that documentary. <laughs> wow, that's, Tommy, that is really a compliment. That is really a compliment. I mean, we just, you know, I got an hour of stories to tell, so I, I just, uh, 
uh, you know, I'm very flattered, very flattered. My, pl my pleasure. I want to thank you so much for coming on today. And, um, you know, maybe we'll talk again next year. And, and, and I hope uh, you have a great day. And please stay safe in this crazy time of COVID. Tommy, thank you very much. Love my pleasure. Bye. My pleasure. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Greg Hilbers. Ain't he a cool dude? Nice guy. I mean, I expected him to be very dark and bitter like so many guys from that period, right? But no, he was a great, humble guy, and I love talking to him today. And I want to thank him for coming on today from the bottom of my heart. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, There's no shame in living in the past, because the present sucks. Liar, dudes! <laughs>